Hi, Matt Fatty here. With a bit going on at the moment, we thought we'd go through a bit of a market update. So obviously there's a fair bit going on in markets and some of this is, uh, is being amplified very much by the media. So we thought we'd have a quick dive into what's going on and why. Uh, so the first part of this video, we're going to just quickly go through some of what's going on and have a bit of a look at some of the detail of it. Uh, that's the short version and then we'll do uh, the back end of the video, we're going to do a much more sort of detailed dive into some of that data. So feel free to stop anywhere you like through the video, pause, rewind. Some of the things we're going to go through are going to be a little bit complicated, but we're going to try and sort of step through those in a sort of bit by bit fashion. Uh, but if there's anything that uh, you'd like us to delve into in a bit more detail, obviously let us know. We'd love to crack open uh, any of these concepts. But there's a fair bit to cover, so I'm just going to go through a bit of a quick version, a quick-ish version uh, up front. And then as I said, we'll dive into a bit more detail, a little bit, bit of history is how do we get here um, and with a bit of an outlook to the future as well. So what's really going on in markets? Well, before we get into that, I think probably the first thing is just a quick recap in terms of why, why listen to us, why listen to the experts? Because um, we often talk a bit about hit complete wealth that um, you know, trusting experts or, or, or just trust the experts or believe the experts isn't necessarily a great um, mantra. We prefer more of the sort of trust but verify sort of thing because, you know, information is one thing, information's a starting point, but we need to turn that information into knowledge, knowledge about, you know, what to do and how, but ultimately our goal is to apply some wisdom, i.e. how do we take that information, turn it into knowledge and actually apply that in a way that actually has a, uh, a, a proper uh, outcome for us. So we spend a lot of time um, trying to make sure not only do we get the right information, but we turn that in or we acquire the right kind of knowledge on how to act. Um, most importantly, understanding the limitations. You know, what is it that we know, but most importantly, what is it that we don't know? We're very focused on um, what, what is, has been demonstrated and can be demonstrated versus what's speculated. And a lot of what we're gonna look at today is trying to understand that separation of demonstration versus speculation. Because a lot of what, particularly the media like to, to do is take something that, um, that has been or could potentially be a demonstrated principle or, or outcome and speculate about um, what that means for the future. And, and that line often gets a bit blurred between what's really been dem demonstrated versus speculated. So a big part of that, I think, though, is experience really matters. Um, and not just because it's by far the best way of understanding things, we can certainly study history, and certainly that's a, a very important part, um, but experience allows principles to be formed and most importantly tested. So if we haven't really been through something, it's very difficult to get a full contextual understanding of that without that experience. Um, and as it turns out, experience uh, can be surprisingly rare, and particularly in the financial services industry, what we found is in recent years, the industry's changed fairly dramatically. Uh, as, as late as 2019, there was over 28,000 uh, financial advisors in Australia, and it's now closer to 17,000, only a few years later. And what's probably even more striking is uh, a recent report that came out in May of this year, which updated those numbers to just over 17,000, also found that of those advisors, only 1,381, so around 8%, had more than 15 years experience in the industry. So while it might seem like financial services as an industry has been around a long time, it turns out that the, the experience within the industry in recent times has dramatically contracted. Now, fortunately for us at Complete Wealth, all four of our advisors have been around more than 15 years. Uh, in fact, um, some as, as long as 30. So we've been through um, various cycles. We've been through the tech wreck, we've been through the GFC, we've been through right back even to earlier in my career, things like the collapse of long-term capital management and the Russian debt crisis and the Asian crisis in the late 1990s. So that experience means not only have we seen um, the theoretical examples of what's happened in markets before, but we've actually been through those cycles. And that's gonna be pretty important, I think, going forward because there's a lot about this particular um, long-term cycle and that, that really is gonna matter. So um, the, the other advantage that I suppose is what it tells us is that no matter how many times we hear about it, it's different this time or there's a change in sort of paradigm is that because we understand the fundamentals, because we take the time to make sure that, that we do really do know what we know, 
um, we can rely on the fact that fundamentals always win. And so whilst there might be periods of time where it look like fundamentals are strained, and we've certainly seen that in recent years, at the end of the day, fundamentals win out, and that's the, the, the ultimate thing we can hang our hat on. That, that's what we know we can rely on, um, that, that at the end of the day, it is gonna come back to those fundamentals, and as long as we stick to that, we're going to be okay. So, um, so as we sort of go through this, I think there's a, a, a few principles I think that's really important to keep in mind, because I think these get lost in the noise a lot, especially you know, in the current situation where yeah, you know, there's a lot of conjecture around, um, you know, who's responsible and what the actions are. If we compile things back to fundamentals and understand, you know, what what a, what really does apply, then it makes understanding a lot of these apparently, you know, uh, complex concepts actually relatively straightforward. So the first thing I always like to remind myself is there's no such thing as government money. A lot of what we're going to talk about today is is government um, printing of money and and government's impact on the money supply, but it's really important to understand there's no such thing as money. And in fact, there's no such thing as company profits either. At the end of the day, there's just the, the productive output of human beings, of individuals. So we all do things that generate value in an economy, and it's that economy that gets recorded, that, that, that value creation in the economy that gets recorded as company profits. And the government money is either the taxes that the government collects at a particular point in time, or the money that they've printed that, that will later be paid for by that productive output. So it's really important to understand that at any time we're talking about money, we're not talking about resource um, generation or value generation. We're talking about uh, a call on that future resource generation. But most importantly, that government money is only our money today or our money in the past or our money in the future. So whenever we talk about government money, we're really talking about the productive capacity of people. Um, and so therefore it's really important to appreciate that one person's income or one person's expense is another person's income and vice versa. So whenever incomes are rising, then we know someone's expenses are rising and so on. So those two things are, are important that we understand that they're linked. And by the same token, one person's liability is another person's asset. So whenever we talk about um, li defaults, particularly in, 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 in credit markets, etc. We need to keep in mind that we're talking about someone else's asset. So it's, it might be good for one uh, part of society to be getting relief, if you like, from, from debts, but that also means that someone else is paying for that by way of their assets being depleted. And if those assets are government assets, again, keep in mind that there's no such thing as government assets. There's only calls on productive people's resources. And that's all money is. So money is simply a call on future resources. So in the short term, it can seem like um, it, it itself is the resource, but at the end of the day, it's just a commodity we use to acquire them. So the reason we store money, the reason we, we, we have financial wealth is a call on for future purchasing power resources. So we need to make sure that that money is at least maintaining, if not hopefully enhancing a little bit, that future purchasing power. And when the supply of money in particular uh, is growing too fast, then that's putting that at risk. And that's really what we want to talk about when it comes to things like inflation. Um, and so it, the, the fundamental thing to, to recognise is money isn't wealth. The only way wealth is created is through productivity. And it's only genuine productivity, not necessarily the measure of productivity. Um, we'll talk a little bit about measures versus reality as we go through this. But wealth is produced by basically by human beings taking a bunch of inputs and finding a way to make them more valuable than that input. And the more we do that, either individually or collectively, the more an economy can actually grow. Um, so CPI, which is the measure we, we're going to hear a lot about and, and certainly we'll hear about um, consistently over the next couple of years, it's really important to appreciate that CPI, therefore, is not a measure infl of inflation. CPI is a measure of prices, uh, which could be an indication that there's inflation, Inflation is simply there's too much money now available, the, the, the money supply, the amount of money in the system has grown at a rate faster than the, the economy itself has grown. So the economic output's only grown by say 5%. Uh, GDP growth would be the measure of that, has grown by 5%. But the money supply, and, and we'll talk a bit about how money is created, but that's grown at a faster rate. And if that grows at a faster rate, then prices go up, okay? That's inflation. But prices can go up for different reasons, and we'll look a little bit about, into that as well. 
prices can go up for reasons that are essentially supply and demand driven. And we've seen a lot of disruption to that in recent times. And so we'll delve into a little bit about, about how that might drive things. But I want you to really keep in mind as we go through this is that CPI isn't inflation. It may indicate that there is inflation, but it isn't actually inflation itself. Uh, and the final thing I want you to keep in mind as we go through this, and, and, and generally when you're dealing with particularly uh, market commentary, is that economies are not zero-sum games. I think one of, the, one of the, the big fallacies that people get a little bit caught up on is because parts of economic activity at a particular point in time are a zero-sum game. An employee going to their boss asking for a pay rise at that point in time is effectively asking their employer to take a cut to profit. But it's not a zero-sum game because employees can be more productive in the future and therefore the pie itself can continue to grow. So we want to keep in mind that whilst we get lots of indications of zero-sum game, economies themselves are not zero-sum games. So one person's potential win doesn't necessarily mean another person's potential loss, even though, as we talked earlier, one person's income is another person's expense and vice versa. So it's one of those classic sort of dichotomies we need to keep in mind is that just because th there is the appearance of zero-sum games, that economies themselves are definitely not zero-sum games. Okay, so that's the short version. Let's look at what's actually happening. Uh, we're going to look at what we should do about it. Um, we'll, we'll look at why reacting, or what, we, what I call reacting, doesn't really work and the dangers of that. And then we'll have a bit of a look at, you know, what's our outlook sort of going forward. All right, so what's happening? The really short version is markets have taken a dive. But to give that a little bit of, um, put that in a little bit of context, I want to sort of delve into these graphs a little bit. So this is looking at the S&P 500. So keep in mind that this index is the t largest by capitalization, i.e. share price multiplied by the number of shares. Um, so that capitalization index for the top 500 companies in the US. Um, that's constantly changing because those companies get bigger and smaller, but it's, it's a pretty good proxy for a broad spread of the market because it's 500 companies. And you can see here in this graph, we've, we saw that over the last six months, the S&P 500 got up to a high of about just under sort of around sort of 4,800 but it's dropped down a bit now to 3,600, 3,700 odd. So over the last six months, it's down about sort of 19, 20% during that period of time. And that's the news we're hearing. That's the markets have taken a tumble. You know, things are uh, very much on the slide. But if we go back a little bit further, I just want to put a little bit of context in terms of time. If we look at the S&P 500 over the last uh, 12 months or three to five years, we can see this period here, this is the, pre-coronavirus peak. So this is sort of back February, March 2020. You, we can see that this is the coronavirus when it, the pandemic first sort of took hold and the markets dropped sort of 30, 35%. The current market uh, level, at least the S&P 500, is still well above that pre-coronavirus point. So we haven't even actually retreated back to that point as of yet. Now that doesn't mean that we still won't. It doesn't mean there isn't some volatility going forward. But just because we had what seems to be a relatively significant market correction, we're well and truly into a technical bear market, if you like, we're, uh, we're certainly nudging around that sort of 20% level. It's really, at this point, particularly in the US market, is, is only really you know, a, a retraction of relatively recent highs. Similarly, if we look forward to um, the NASDAQ, which is the more tech heavy version, uh, and it probably is slightly more extreme. You know, it's down closer to sort of 28, 30% in, uh, in the last six months. But again, if we compare that, as we can see from the graph here, the coronavirus, pre-coronavirus high, you know, it was sort of getting up around sort of 10,000. It's still quite a bit above that mark. Uh, down a long way from its peak back in November, by, certainly, but, um, but still not back to that level of just a couple of years ago. So, you know, one relatively um, uh, uh, extreme view can be that markets are off 20 to 30 percent. Um, but another equally uh, accurate contextual view is markets are up over the last 12 months if we're going to use the S&P uh, 500 as an example. Um, so just want to put a bit of relativity into, you know, the numbers in the short term, yes, but not so much uh, necessary in the long term yet. We'll talk a bit about that in the more detailed section as to, to the makeup of that market and why, in fact, there's, there's actually a lot more to that um, than those headline numbers. Sorry, but we're a long way off anything like a GFC or 
um, certainly Great Depression type market crashes at this point in time. The inflation is a big one and inflation is a real tricky one and again I'll delve into this in, a, in quite a bit more detail in the more detailed section of this video but I just want to get you uh, to, to appreciate the complexity when it comes to how do we actually measure inflation because again inflation is the amount of money in the system which is very difficult to measure partly because of the way money is created versus economic output and this is a this is a graph we had in one of our updates um, I think it was the end of 2020 or 2021 can't remember right now but where we, 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 we peel that apart to say, okay, well, let's have a look at what inflation is because inflation is the change in prices, or the CPI, sorry, is the change in prices. That's what, we, what we're talking about has, has gone up, the CPI has increased. Now, there's a good, ex, good reason to expect that that is inflation, and I'll get into that in a moment, but if we look at prices, we can see the disparity in terms of where prices have gone over the last sort of 20 years or so, looking at this particular graph. And you can see in some areas, things have actually deflated quite considerably. So, you know, the, the official headline CPI of 57% over 20 years, where we see, you know, as much as sort of minus, pretty much minus 90 for audio, visual and computing equipment. So we see the deflationary effects of technology. And again, I'll talk a bit more about um, the potential impact of that in the detailed section, but things like clothing and footwear, furniture and um, furnish, furnishings, motor vehicles, etc. Anything that has essentially been uh, outsourced globally and, and been part of that global supply chain has in fact deflated quite considerably. And the things that are closer to home, we see things like education, medical and hospital services, water and sewages, things that are more localised and, and, and we can't sort of export those particularly labour costs to lower cost parts of the world. Those prices have risen in some senses quite considerably more. And it's the combination of those things that comes out to that average. So this is one of the reasons why when the RBA um, releases its version of the CPI, it takes that ABS data and massages it depending on you know, short-term price movements, what it thinks are price movements as opposed to gen genuine inflation, i.e. excess money supply, and also tries to um, uh, change the levelling or, or the, the relative contribution of each of these numbers. So it's by no means an exact science. And it's one of the reasons why the RBA seems to always be sort of chasing its tail in terms of trying to get that number in the band. But there's two big themes here that, that are really important to appreciate. One is globalisation has helped export particularly labour costs to low cost areas of the world and increasingly globalised supply chains have allowed us to buy incredibly cheap things on Amazon from who knows where it was made in the world, mostly China. But we've been able to buy things at, at, at ridiculously cheap prices because of the effect of that globalisation in the last 20 years. The other thing has been not just the improvement in technology, but the pervasiveness of technology. As technology moves into more and more things, they themselves become more deflationary in the sense that there's a new version next year and it's better, even if the device itself is something like a fridge or a washing machine, that in itself you know, has, is not really a technological advance per se, but more and more technology is being put into those sorts of um, consumer goods. So, um, inflation, there's a bit more to it. Um, all right, so this, the, I guess this, the, the million dollar question, right, is what should we do about it? Well, uh, again, these things are to a degree predictable. We know markets are volatile. We know things um, uh, from time to time can be disruptive. Sometimes they're reasonably predictable in terms of the likelihood of um, occurring, but we need to keep in mind that almost everything's foreseeable because we can always speculate as to what might happen. Predicting what will happen, i.e. Foresee, foreseeing things within a reasonably constructive time frame is much more difficult to do. Uh, and again, most predicted things um, don't occur. You know, there's the, there's the, the classic saying of, um, of Samuelson, I think it was, who said that, you know, economists have predicted uh, nine of the last five recessions. The, the, the trouble is, is knowing how many of those predictable things will actually come true within a reasonable time frame. And then the most important thing is then, can we actually take any action on that? Just because we can predict event, an event doesn't necessarily mean we can take an action that's commensurate with the relative risk of that action. And we'll look at, into that in a bit more detail uh, later. But just because something might be very foreseeable or even to a degree predictable doesn't necessarily mean we can take action in that in a way that doesn't actually expose us to more risk than not doing so. And so the way we mo mostly take care of this is by the use of our st stable and growth pool. So in our portfolio construction methodology, one of the key things underpinning this is we understand that stability of, of purchasing power in the short term is critical and that's really what our stable pool's for. 
And that's largely cash, a little bit of things like fixed interest, et cetera, but predominantly is cash based. And the reason we maintain that is because in the relatively short term, say up to three years, it's very difficult to know what our consistent cash flow is going to be for a whole host of reasons, some of them economic, but some of them even structural or tax based. And so we make sure that we, we, we maintain that stable pool so that we have the firepower to get through any short term uh, market volatility and we're not exposed to that sequencing risk that would come if we were forced to sell down units of things that contain growth assets where prices have dropped um, you know, in the short term. So in a really simple sense, that's why we have our um, stable and growth pool. So growth assets being shares and property, we know in the long term they produce good, stable, um, growing earnings, but the prices in the short term are quite volatile. And our stable assets really don't generate any return in the long term because they're really just interest rate based. Um, so their earnings are essentially flat in the long term, but their prices are very stable. So we, that does give us that sort of guaranteed purchasing power. And so by funding our living expenses to the degree that you know, we, we need to from a portfolio, funding those living expenses or those short sort of one to three year term expenses via that pool, means we can then just use the dividends and distributions from our growth assets to essentially top that pool up. And generally that will give us that sort of five to seven year cycle, short cycle we need to make sure if we, even if we are you know, in the more extreme versions of a cycle having to sell down some growth assets, it's only very small at the margin and we can be very judicial in, in sort of what we, uh, what we target in doing so. Because at the end of the day, you know, dividends are quite predictable. Cash flow from growth assets themselves are predictable over multiple years. This particular graph here, we're looking at the dividends paid out of um, the Australian Stock Exchange over the 20 year period from 1980 to sort of 2020. So we can see here in the blue is the dividends being paid. We can see um, you know, the, the orange line here is the capital value, if you like. So we can see here the crash of 87. We can see uh, you know, the Asian crisis up here somewhere, barely, but uh, we can see the tech wreck, which again seems relatively minor in, in the scheme of things now. We can see the effect of the GFC and sort of so on through that period. So these uh, green bars up here are the effect of franking credits when uh, franking came in uh, in the 90s as well. So we've got that opportunity here to, um, to go back through history and say, look, regardless of what happens in an economy over a period of time, lots of different events happened. What happens to corporate profits over that period of time? Well, those who make the profits may change which is a reason for certainly being active in, in our management approach. But most importantly, the economy itself continues to grow, even if it might take even in a, re a recession a couple of quarters of negative growth, there's still growth in earnings. Therefore, there's still dividends. Over time, dividends continue to grow. And in fact, if we look at what that looks like from a you know, relative volatility perspective, these graphs here show us, uh, you know, again, over about a 20 year period, the capital versus income return out of the Australian share market. So we can see here the capital return was a roughly 4.5%, so prices went up by about 4.5%, and the income or the dividends paid was about 4.3, so roughly about the same. But the standard deviation, that is the variability in return year to year, was quite different. So the standard deviation of capital return uh, was 12.6%. So that means if you add two standard deviations to that, so add sort of 25%, to your four and a half, you get to sort of 29 and a half percent. And if you take the 25 off that, so you get to roughly sort of minus 20. So between minus 20 and sort of 29, 95% of the returns happen in that, within that range. So 95% year on year, we're getting down somewhere between minus 20 and somewhere between plus sort of 29. That's a huge range of potential returns one year to the next. But if we look at the standard deviation of income, that's about 1%. In other words, add two, so we add two standard deviations, 2% 2 to our 4.3. So the upper range, you've got 6.3, take two off. So we take 2% off our 4.3. So between 2.3 and 6.3 is 95% of the income returns, uh, dividend returns through that period of time. So in other words, there's always some dividends. Even at the extreme, there's always some dividends. Sometimes they're a bit higher, sometimes they're a bit lower, but there's always that availability of cash flow over that sort of you know few year period, which well, it means that our growth stable pool is uh, sustainable even through you know, reasonable sort of market downturns. So um, I mentioned this earlier on is why you know, one of our tenants is the reactions often don't work. And again, that's back to that principle of um, foreseeable versus predictable versus actionable. 
Um, and a, a recent example of that is looking at uh, the effect of copper prices on, on, on some copper stocks. So here's the, the price of copper. You know, we can see coming out of the coronavirus um, in 2020, we can see the price of copper has gone through the roof. It's, you know, it's, it's up like many other commodities, gone up a long way. So you would think during that period of time, well, that's an easy thing. We'll just buy some copper producers. So Australia really only has one major copper play or pure copper play, and that's Oz Minerals. And its share price performance, if you look at calendar year to date, it's down 11%. So in a very, very high price for its commodities, um, very supportive environment, Oz Minerals share price is actually down 11%. Now, that's not a universal thing. There's other copper producers, some examples, of some American listed copper producers that have performed quite well during that period. But Oz Minerable, as a, as a copper producer, has actually had a negative return, despite the fact that they've had very high copper prices. So it's not always as easy simply to say, okay, well, because something's going to be a fundamental tailwind or driver, that sort of guarantees that we can take action uh, in that sense. And we know that from the Dalbar study and anyone who's seen, you know, certainly seen, certainly seen me talk about investments before, as you're probably sick of hearing about the Dalbar study, but the reality is this is the best indication of what investor behavior does to returns. So the Dalbar study, for those who aren't aware, is essentially a study of investor returns, uh, this is in the US, using investor returns in uh, ma essentially managed funds. So rather than look at the performance of the fund, what this study is looking at is what does in the individual account member achieve? So the fund might, might or the index might generate, say, a 10% return, but what did the people who were invested in that fund achieve? Now, they're invested in the fund for the same amount the whole time, then they'll get the fund return. But if they put more or less in during that period of time, that is they essentially trade the market to some degree, then their return is going to be different. And what the Dalbar study consistently shows over the long term, I've given three uh, examples here of 20 year periods, investor returns, actual investor returns, tend to be significantly lower, generally around about half, the actual return of the market. And the only reason for that is because investors are putting money in and taking money out at the wrong times. And therefore we know from that experience that investor behavior is by far the greatest driver of returns. Again, one of the reasons why to manage that sequencing risk and the need to do so, we use that stable and growth pool uh, philosophy to do so. So, um, and the reason for that is purely mathematics. So that's really what we're fighting against. We know that trading returns are asymmetric. So what do I mean by that? I mean the gain you have to generate is always more than the loss to get back to the same point. And this is a, the graph that sort of shows that. So in a really simple sense, if we start with a dollar um, and, and we lose 50%, so along the x-axis here is the percentage of the loss, okay? And then the y-axis here is what percentage gain do we require to get back to break even? So if we suffer a 50% loss, we actually need now a 100% return in our capital to get back. We had a dollar, we've now got 50 cents. To turn 50 cents back into a dollar, we need to generate 50 cents, and 50 cents on 50 cents is obviously a 100% return. So we need a 100% return to get back to make up for our 50% loss, okay? So it's important to recognize though that what we're talking about here is we're talking about a fundamental loss. Markets fluctuate. And so uh, an analogy I quite like is, is there's a difference between sort of standing on you know, sort of a, a, a bed of foam that's compressed for a while because markets have taken, but, but fundamentally the market is still there. The companies we own are still there. They're still generating the profits, et cetera. They can rebound. But if tiles have been sliced away and what we're standing on now has physically been withdrawn because those companies have gone broke or those earnings that supported those valuations were not real and will never come back, then we are fundamentally at a lower level. So really what we're talking about here is we're talking about making sure that we're protecting the engine of our capital because it's just too hard to get it back. And it's asymmetric. It's the, 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 the more we lose, the more proportion we have to gain. Right through to a 90% you know, a, a loss means we have to get a 900% gain to get back to break even. And that's one of the reasons why we, the approach we take when it comes to portfolio management is so earnings based because we know that, that, that earnings are the ultimate driver of valuation. And, and as long as we are uh, looking for reasonably uh, predictable future earnings, that capital base is going to be protected. So all these things sort of go against us when we're trying to take action in a market that may seem like it was predictable to some degree, but we just don't know what the outcome is going to be and it, mathematics um, really sort of bite us if we get it wrong. So what's the outlook? Um, well, 
There's a few things to this, I suppose. I, one of the most important things I want to touch on just briefly is the outlook for energy and resource, because it's both a positive and a negative news. Negative in the sense that energy is the most important thing, because energy is the input to everything else. Uh, and not only that, energy is generally an input multiple times in part of the economic machine. So when the price of energy goes up, the price of everything goes up exponentially so. One of the reasons why energy is so important and the price of energy has been going up. Uh, resources are another component to that. We'll look at money versus prices, in particular look at the creation of money and how that's changed in recent times and therefore what effect that may have from an inflation perspective. But also we'll look a little bit in terms of regions. Is this a, is this a global issue? Is it concentrated in Australia, the US, how does it look? And then we'll touch just briefly on the relative balance between companies, governments and people. Because as I said at the start, only people are productive, but wealth is held for periods of time within companies and governments. So we need to look at how that's sort of moving around as well to understand what the outlook's going to be. So this graph is a little bit to it, so I'm just gonna sort of break it down a little bit for you. This is basically looking at oil inventories. So this isn't oil in the ground or oil that we can get access to. Think of this as oil that's sitting somewhere that we can get our hands on very quickly in terms of inventory. So the, the only thing that really matters here is the trend. Okay, so we can see um, oil inventories were building coming particularly um, out of the coronavirus because obviously a lot of um, oil demand dropped off. And as a result of that, there was less need to keep re to rebuild those uh, inventories. So that started to sort of run down through this sort of period. But we got to the point sort of about this time last year when we were below um, break even, if you like, in terms of maintenance of that. So we can now see that, that so those oil inventories uh, in, a, in a global sense are now well below. And in fact, we're getting to the point where it's, it's going to take a lot of reversal to get back to just meeting essentially demand. So this sort of green dotted line here um, is really um, the sort of think of that as the break even sort of point. So we've got a long way to go before we can kind of get back to that. Now, is that easy to do? Yes and no. Part of the problem with it though is one of the reasons why that's been allowed to occur is because the capex or the capital expenditure in this area has declined substantially in recent years whole host of reasons around that, around you know emissions and greenhouse gases and all those sort of things, which I won't get into in this particular video, but the bottom line is all um, capital expenditure, both in maintenance and capacity for hydrocarbon-based fuel in particular, has been on the decline. Now we know when resources and energy are, are not invested, the, the maintenance and investment isn't continued to, to maintain, let alone grow capacity, we are going to run into supply constraints. We saw that in the early 2000s just as we hit a, a, a resource and energy super cycle with China going through massive growth and stimulus, we're going to face the same thing for the next few years simply because this can't rebuild fast enough. So energy prices are going up. Will they go up for the long term? That's probably a bit more of a geopolitical issue rather than a practical one. The world's got hundreds of years worth of oil. There's plenty of forms of energy that can be used to, to, to regain position, but the world still uses over 80% oil. Um, uh, or hydrocarbon based fossil fuels, if you like, to power, um, to, to power it. And, th and the demand for energy continues to grow. So if the supply doesn't get uh, rebooted, if you like, or, or that e expenditure doesn't at least uh, recover, then energy is going to continue to get more expensive. It's, that's just a, a fundamental um, uh, problem we're going to face. And because the, the cost of energy is going to go up, that's going to increase the cost of everything. And so that's not an inflationary thing, that's things costing more and requiring more resources to go towards it. So that's part of the noise that we're seeing here. And this is why initially a lot of the um, central banks around the world sort of 12 to 18 months ago were sort of suggesting no interest rates won't need to rise and inflation won't be a problem because they saw this sort of coming and said, well, these will be relatively short term constraints that once the price of energy goes up, even if it sits at a new high and stays there, that won't continue to increase prices because it'll be kind of one off and it'll work its way through the system. It's definitely going to happen and it's probably going to be a bit more extreme, but we'll talk a minute about what um, the money supply side of things uh, does. And here's, here's where the rubber hits the road. So this is looking at um, um, central banks balance sheets. Now really what that, all that means is how much money they have. Central banks um, uh, historically have always had some degree of sort of money on their balance sheet, if you like. But in, in particularly in, in recent crises, that production of money has been used uh, 
um, let's just say at a level that's sort of relatively unprecedented. And what, what this graph shows is basically most of the um, major economies around the world and the green being all the other advanced economies. And you can see coming into the GFC, this is the GFC back here, you can see that, that they were growing, okay? Now, a lot of that was emerging markets. Um, we can see here that the US, which is the blue, was relatively constrained at that point, but then the GFC came along and things started to expand. And you can see it's a relatively universal effect. Um, the US uh, in here, Japan had always been pretty extreme and continued to go so. But because of the relative effect of printing money to get out of the GFC, if you like, and the, and the perception of success into that, and I'll go into a bit more detail in our detailed section as to why they believe that to be the case, is that when we ran into the coronavirus, governments just went nuts. They basically just said, okay, we've seen this before. The best way to do this is to pump the system for liquidity, so we'll print more money. And we've seen a huge expansion uh, of, of money in that period of time. And keep in mind that if money grows faster than the economic output of the economy, then that's inflation. And that is absolutely what we've seen. The difficulty is this is sitting on the, on the um, Fed and other central banks balance sheet. The question is, is how quickly has a lot of this fed its way into the system because what they've actually been doing is part of what they call the, the quantitative easing. Once they put interest rates to the point where interest rates were so low that they didn't create more credit growth or money growth, they started to buy those assets back off banks. So every time the banks would create more new money, the Fed would take them or the RBA or someone would buy that money and sort of sit it on their balance sheet so that the banks would go out and leave and, and lend even more. So that's where that expansion has really come from. It's come from banks lending out more money because every time they lend out more money, the Fed or some the central banks, ECB, would take that money and stick it on their own balance sheet and pretend it kind of didn't exist from a money uh, in the system perspective. So the question is, is how quickly does that money get into the system and or how is it repaid? And it's now at the point where the size of, that, of those balance sheets are far in excess of anything that can be reasonably expected to be repaid. And so there has to be some form of inflation to make that go away. We're at the end of a long-term debt cycle. This cycle started with Bretton Woods back in 1944. So we're well and truly due and we're at an extreme that we haven't seen before. So from that perspective, there is going to have to be some underlying inflation. Notwithstanding, we're gonna have some price oriented things to, to help muddy that water a little bit, but it does mean prices, generally speaking, have to be higher going forward to help us sort of work our way out of that. Um, so that's the bad news. The good news though is, is as a result of that, what's happened in terms of particularly markets um, being sort of inflated by a lot of that cheap money and that availability of credit has, has um, a lot of the, let, let's call it the less productive parts or, or the more pie in the sky futuristic um, company valuations started to get to very extreme levels. And they're some of the things we've seen already come off. We looked at in particular when we saw the, the returns of the NASDAQ in the last sort of six months or so. In the detailed section, I'll go through some more specific examples to see the, the effect of that. But what we've seen is, is, and we've talked about this a number of times over the last couple of years, is this um, reversal of the fortunes of the relative valuations of growth versus value companies. Now, those terms are relatively poorly defined, but let me give you a bit of an indication of what we generally mean when we're talking about a value company, is your more sort of predictable earnings, it's not gonna shoot the lights out, it's gonna get a, a relatively steady growth of earnings over a period of time. Whereas a growth company is more like, literally like a tech company. It's a company that, it may not even be making any money at this point in time, it may be being priced on its sales or revenue growth, but the expectation is it'll get so big that one day it'll be able to dominate and make a heap of money. In the long term, there's no question that value companies outperform growth because most growth companies fail. Sooner or later they fail. They either turn into value companies because they get big enough and, and successful enough or they don't and they fail. So growth in the short term always looks better. It's maybe, the, let's call it the dark side of the force, but, the, um, but value always wins in the long term. But since the GFC, we can see that, you know, so this is going back to the 70s, we can see that value essentially, as we go up here, value's doing better. And as we head down here, growth's doing better relative to value, right? So this is just different types of companies within a market. And so we can see that value has, was doing a lot better. We came into the tech wreck. This is the tech, this is the, the, the tech boom, if you like, smashing growth. Um, at, th at that stage, it almost didn't matter what you, what, as long as you were dot com something, you were, your share price was going through the roof. And this is the tech wreck. This is the reversal of that 
Scenario and value gets sort of back to the front. But again, the GFC comes along. And pretty much coming out of the GFC, we've seen a huge outperformance of growth all the way through. And in the last couple of years, we've sort of looked like we've been finally now hitting the bottom. Now, why is this important? Well, because growth stocks are much more akin to market gambling, and they tend to only outperform when, mark, when money's really cheap and lots of uh, speculative money's entering a market. And they don't normally last that long. This is a very, very long period for growth to be outperforming value. Um, it's a very dangerous part because it means that, as, that, that resources are not being allocated very effectively through an economy. Markets aren't working very efficiently. So it's not a particularly good long-term position to be in. And therefore, um, it almost doesn't matter what you buy. In fact, the, the lower quality of the company, the more likely you are to make money through share price appreciation. That's not a great way for sustainable investing. It's certainly not the approach that we take. Um, but that definitely now looks like it's finally reversing and we'll get back to a, a more normal operation of markets. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means a few things, but it means back to reality, even though that reality hasn't been around for 15 odd years. It means the cost of debt and capital are moving back to more appropriate levels. So valuations will, will be more reasonable uh, and easier to understand. It, value is at record levels, so um, the good stuff is, is, is actually at reasonable prices to buy. The good news is balance sheets around the world are generally reasonably strong. Um, so the opportunity set is reasonably wide and deep because um, as we talked about before, this has largely been a relatively concentrated uh, boom, if you like, particularly in the US and particularly in tech stocks. Certainly not exclusively, but, but much more so than, than other booms in the past. The other thing that's important to note, and this is a part effect of the, partially a, a, an effect of the money supply side, but if we look at the, the first quarter um, Janice Henderson um, dividend report, which reports basically um, global company profits and dividends, the first quarter of 2022 was a record uh, in, in all sorts of ways. There was record growth over 11% to record levels. So more dividends were paid out in the first quarter of 2021 than ever had before. Every sector in, 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 in markets were, were growing at double digits. So it was a very broad uh, increase. 94% of company maintain or raise their dividends. Earnings growth is up very high and every region was up. So that looks like a very good sort of backdrop. But if we look at what's happened, you know, over the last sort of, you know, 15 years or so, this graph gives us a really good indication of how the opportunity set has changed. Again, what this graph is showing, the, the sort of dark blue or navy, if you like, is essentially um, US equity markets, right, as measured um, uh, uh, by the S&P 500. And the, the sort of lighter blue, if you like, is the rest of the world minus that market. Okay, so we've seen essentially for sort of 14, 15 years, those markets have gone sideways. And all of the return, all of the growth has really been in US markets. So whilst there's going to be a bit of pain, there's certainly going to be some losers out of um, this sort of end of cycle activity would be our prediction. The reality is there's still plenty of places in the world where, um, uh, where, where there is actually still some opportunity. So it's not a case of global recession and bad news for everybody. It's actually more of a return to a potentially normal albeit there might be a fair bit of pain in the short term in some advanced economies to do so. And a really good example of that is China. And again, I'll go through this in a bit more detail in our detailed section. But China's policy in this has been restrained. This is really looking at their credit growth you know, over a long period of time. And you can see most importantly, very recently in the last couple of years, their credit growth has been negative. So they had a bit of an issue with property and some property speculation a couple of years back. That's had an effect certainly on their market. They've clamped down very hard on certain companies as well. And so they've had, while the rest of the world, and particularly the US has been expanding, they've actually been contracting their money supply. So China relatively is in very good shape compared to a lot of other areas of the world. Uh, there, and there's some other pockets of the world that are similar. But China obviously now is a very large, very significant economy and does uh, impact the global economy in very important ways. So it's certainly not a everything's in the same boat and we're all, you know, um, we're all on the same journey regardless. Um, there are parts of the world that are in a very strong position relative to some of the news we'll get out of the US. So look, um, that's the short version, to be fair. Um, we'll cover some of those concepts in a bit more detail now going into a detailed version, but hopefully that gives you a decent overview on where markets are at the moment from a proper perspective.
and also some of the reasons why, um, yes, we're going to hear some bad news and some pain going um, forward, but it does not mean that the opportunity set uh, doesn't exist and that there won't be some still good cash flow and good earnings over the, over the next sort of couple of years. But we will see returns probably on the low side even to flat, simply because market pricing, you know, as much as the growth will come down, we need the value to, to get up to the same degree to get the same level. So there will be some opportunity there, um, but it's certainly going to be uh, much more reward for stock picking and active management as opposed to just sort of buy the index and hang on. So thanks for joining me and stick around if you're interested in the detail. Mm -hmm.